Okay, welcome to part two of my deep dive into how I made the song Crow's Eye from my newest solo release, What's Coming. Now that I've gone through the whole song completely, I've decided to break this series up into three episodes. Part one was guitar, bass, and drums. Part two this episode will be keyboards and vocals. And part three will be on mixing the song. So once I had the rhythm section tracked, I knew I wanted some keyboards for counterpoint to whatever the vocals were going to end up doing. And for some reason, that heavily modulated piano sound in Ashes to Ashes popped into my head as something that could be a good starting point for a sound. Let's dive in. I know I talked about the drum MIDI earlier and I left the MIDI for this song, but in general I like to print um, all MIDI tracks as audio, and the keyboards in this song were no exception. However, I went a step backwards so you could see just how I made this kind of like main counter melody sound. There's other keyboards in different parts of the song as well, but I left those as audio. We'll get to those in a minute. It's two uh, MIDI instruments. One is this Mellotron from Arturia. It's kind of just like an old timey piano. And let me just bypass all the effects and just hear what instrument I have going in this contact player, the awesome Plucked Piano by Sonic Couture, and it's called Pluxacord. This is the Pluxacord sound dry. Very attacky uh, and no sustain. So what kind of effects I put on it? Well, I compressed it a lot with this gain reduction from Joey Sturgis. That's just to get it louder and more intense. Then phase. Some distortion. Then I threw on some EQ. Taking out some of that like high mids there and boosting some mids. Just getting a little too harsh up there. And then with the Mellotron from Arturia, just bringing a little bit more note value back into it. So let's hear that in uh, with the rhythm section. Okay, but before we get to that little pad sound, I want to show you what is doubling that keyboard sound in the song is backing vocals. That's me doing some ooze, doing a lot of ramping and not trying to do them perfect on purpose to just kind of give it a little bit more chorusy effect against the keyboard. So here's them together. really kind of the signature um, sound or part in the song. And I also really dig how it fits in over the lead vocal rhythmically, which is kind of interesting. You 
no, it's, there's like old trick in music where you have like you have your lead vocal and then like another instrument kind of filling in between the phrases of the lead vocal. This keyboard part is definitely doing that to a certain extent, but it's also kind of stepping on the vocal a little bit too. It's coming in in a weird spot rhythmically. Why did I orchestrate it that way in relationship to the lead vocal? And the answer is all the music was recorded before I did the vocals, before I wrote the vocals, before I wrote the rhythm and melody. I have an idea for the vocal melody and the verses, and I started sort of scat singing on top of that. This part was bugging me when I started doing that, so I muted it. And I was like, what? Well, probably not going to use it. And I. Then I went ahead and ended up recording all the verse vocals in one sitting. And then I unmuted those keyboards and I was like, oh, it kind of is stepping on it, but like kind of in a cool way. I think I think I actually like that. What you're trying to do is just create an environment where you get a high amount of happy accidents happening. That is definitely a happy accident where I wrote a part, thought it wasn't working, went back to it and went, you know what? It isn't working on a certain level, but on another level, it's really cool. So I left it in. Let's look at this keyboard sound in the chorus. Sounds like just a really simple arpeggio already in the preset. I'm probably just holding down one note. Even though the notes are moving around there, you don't hear the movement much. It really just comes off more as a pad, I think, in the chorus. But it does get its moment later in the bridge where you actually really notice it. I'm gonna just mute that lead melody for a second. It's not even imperfectly in time with the with the song, but in the second chorus, I took some of these high notes from the counterpoint MIDI and printed them as audio so I could add more effects to them and stuff. So again, that comes from the uh, contact plexichord sound. I've just printed those as audio, done some editing, and adding more reverb and delay to them. What do we have in this last track? Oh, this is from the Arturia uh, Synth Suite as well, their CS80. Love that plugin. It's incredible. That's an incredible keyboard. That just pretty much wraps up the keyboards. The production technique is super dry verses, and then all these delays and echoes come on in the choruses, and it gets like trippier and more spacious and actually more Spartan musically. There's less parts and less rhythm going on in the chorus, but when the delays come on, it just kind of makes it swim and float. The verses, again, totally dry. There's zero ambient effects on the verse lead vocal. Let's just take it one at a time here. I'm just gonna walk you through what I'm doing. I often just have this plugin as the first plugin in the chain on a vocal track because a lot of times you just wanna do some really basic corrective things before you hit the rest of your chain. One of the most basic things is just to have a high pass filter. We're rolling off the lowest of the lows up to a certain point where we feel like we're not cutting out uh, necessary stuff, but we're cutting out as much rumble on the bottom that you don't want. I mean, I have a high pass filter on the mic when I'm singing probably on a channel on the mic pre as well, but pretty much always dialing that in and cutting out as much as I can 
without affecting the overall tonality of the performance too much. This is the corrective EQ before the rest of the vocal chain. Then another frequency balancing step is to add a multiband compressor to dynamically control the vocal track. And just like that I felt the world change. So this is set fairly aggressively to cut out high mids. You know, I wanted it to be kind of warm and, and not harsh, so kept coming back to this control. I just thought it sounded better without the spikiness in, the, in that 2K range. And just like that, I felt the world Here's without it. And just like that, I felt the world change. And just like that, I felt the world change. So that's a lot of gain reduction going on overall, even though it's frequency dependent. But I'm going to go even one more level of compression and try to bring out a little bit more detail in, in the vocal with probably my favorite vocal smashing plugin. So what are we doing here? We're smashing the vocal more. Just like that, I felt now you can really hear the ambience. Change. And though the people stand in silence That's probably where I was really <laughs> hoping to control that high sort of fried out sound and in my though voice the people stand in silence I mean it's cool but it was like a little extreme there So now we got a very very compressed sound and But now we've added all this compression, and what happens when we um, compress vocals a lot is uh, we tend to bring out the sibilance. Because sibilance, when you're talking, is totally necessary to understand the words you're saying, but we need to be able to hear it in a certain relationship to the other part of the word or, or syllable. This is one of my favorite uh, de-essing plugins. I think it does a good job at taking out the offensive, but leaving most of what you need to hear a, a voice naturally. That's great too because it's, it's got this waveform here, the scrolling, so you can see where it's picking up sibilance, where it's reducing its gain. Gives you a good idea of what it's doing when you don't need too much and you just need the right amount. This is a great one. And then we have the venerable Phoenix 2 tape emulation plugin. And what's great about this is you really don't know what you're doing. You just play with the knobs until you hear something that you like. These are the sort of flavors of saturation. And then within each one of these, groups you have gold which is neutral in terms of brightness or darkness opal which is more dark and sapphire which is adding some brightness so I'm on dark essence which is probably my favorite one it adds quite a bit of low to low mid harmonics to the sound and then I'm leaving the EQ as it were kind of flat so here it is without it And with it. And though the people stand in silence, nobody wanted. You're getting a big volume boost here, but it's also making it thicker and warmer and just nicer for this particular part. So that's my vocal chain. So for the chorus vocal, I'm doing pretty much the same stuff over here, but I am adding a whole bunch of time-based effects. Here it is dry. Can't wake up. Micro pitch shift. Can't wake up. The OG version of a micro pitch shift. Left side is 10 cents, a fraction of a note lower. The right side is a fraction of a note higher. It's basically two harmonies very close to the original. Then we've got some slap. Slap and reverb are probably the most iconic vocal effects. Slap is one delay repeat that's fairly close to 100 milliseconds or so. And that's being provided by this V delay. So what does that sound like? It's all right, hold it back. Hear the two, those two together. It's all right, hold it back. 
Mm, got a lot more going on in the stereo field now and just like a bigger sound overall. Then we have a quarter note delay. I think this is the one that has the automation on it, actually. Yeah, send D. It's all right, hold it back. Right, so you can it's see. It's all wrong. I've got Keep. this part of the word is getting sent to the delay, but minus 24 dB, and this part of the word is minus 14. What I'm going for is to really hear the delay on the last syllable of these phrases. Can't wake up. It's all right. Hold it back. It's all wrong. Keep it straight. And then I've got this guy, eighth note delay, pretty low. It's all right, hold it back. Just a quicker it's delay with some feedback. Wrong. Just making Keep it swim, it almost like a reverb. Just so you can hear it with, with and without the double. Here's without the double. It's all right. With. Hold it back. It's all wrong. Keep it straight. The very first vocal takes I'm doing on these, I'm figuring it out. I'm writing it. I have the lyrics mostly worked out, but like how they really rhythmically get phrased in there, the whole vibe of the performance, I'm just figuring that out as I'm doing the takes. So it's not uncommon for me to have 30 vocal takes of a whole song, which seems like a lot, but if you listen to the first take compared to the last take, they can be wildly different. Really no way you could even edit between the two because they're just completely different approaches. So that's what I'm doing. I'm, I'm just kind of figuring things out, locking things down, making last minute changes to the lyrics, and I'll do some more takes, then I'll realize, you know what, I actually want to make that feel quieter there, so I'll redo that. One thing you want to try and do when you decide to start recording vocals is lock down your vocal chain, your analog vocal chain going into your interface so that way you can punch in and or edit between all your takes. I generally stop after I feel like I've sung the song pretty good a few times. I generally am not going to even be listening to the first 20 because if I've gone that long, you know, I'm not feeling good about it yet. So it's usually those last five, maybe the last two or three takes, I'm getting tired and you can hear it, so I'll have to go back a little bit further. One of the advantages to doing it that way is you have all these takes and then you can sift through them, compile your best single performance for each section of the song. But since you have all these takes that were done, they usually edit to become doubles pretty well. Pretty much have the same chain on every on every track. I'll, I might go in and you know, ease up on the compression or compress harder in certain sections or maybe make the chorus a little brighter if it's not cutting through. If I find an initial chain, I usually keep it and then modify the taste for each section. All right, that does it for the vocal, lead vocals. The third and final installment of this series will be on mixing the song, and I should have that up soon. Thanks for watching. Later.